Hello, welcome to the first Writers Speak Wednesday for the spring semester. I'm Kathy Russo. I, I guess you would call me the curator of the series now that Susie Merrill has handed it over to me. Um, I just want to thank our generous sponsors, Ellen Hansen and Richard Perlman, for underwriting this whole series. Without them, we couldn't do it, so we really appreciate it. And thank you, Book Hampton, for coming every week and uh, selling the author's books. Um, next Wednesday, we have Robin Desser with our own Dan Meneker. And if you don't know who she is, she's been an editor at Knopf for 20 years. She's like one of the biggest editors working today. So it'll be a different kind of writer's speak. It'll be a conversation about the business instead of a reading. So we're looking forward to that. And tonight we have Carly Timby introducing Major Jackson. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Our speaker this evening has authored three collect collections of poetry. The two most recent collections, Holding Company and Hoops, were both finalists for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literature and Poetry. And his first collection, Leaving Saturn, not only won the 2000 Cave Canem Poetry Prize, but was also a finalist for a National Book Critics Award Circle. He is currently a professor at the University of Vermont a faculty member of the Bennington College Writing Seminars, and serves as poetry editor for the Harvard Review. It is my pleasure to introduce to you all the highly esteemed Major Jackson. Good evening. My name is Major. I'm a poet. And uh, before I read, I want to thank everyone for coming out this um, this evening. And I want to thank my friends who are kind of here in the audience, uh, who are probably partly responsible, if not fully responsible, for me being here. Uh, Julie and Susan and Kathy for organizing. My friend Star Black, who's always a pleasure to see her. Um, I'm going to open up with uh, a new poem. I, I left a sheaf of poems uh, on the airplane. And so I want to send a shout out to the maybe passenger who's reading them right now <laughs> and probably mortified at what they're reading. Um, I'm going to read some new poems and then I'll read uh, poems from the book. Um, let me start off with this poem. Um, it's called uh, OK Cupid. And I am, f I'm old school. When we date, you go to a bar and you hopefully pray to get lucky. Um, uh, and OK Cupid, I hear, is a website that is an online website. So, um, uh, I didn't try that when I tried another one briefly. I lasted three days. And, uh, what was painful was feeling, uh, answering all the questions. Um, and getting categorized. And I, I came out of that experience. And I was like, I hate categories. Around the time that I was um, doing this, I was also teaching um, the poets of Fluxus, in particular a poet named Jackson McLow, who um, uh, creates poems based on procedures, these parameters he's given himself. So He's kind of the ghost voice behind here. And this felt risky for me, writing this kind of poem, uh, mainly because I like to be in control, as you'll see with some of the uh, later poems. But here I just had to let go. Um, and I should apologize in advance. If you occupy any subjectivity that is named, it is not you. This is about the concept of online dating and what it suggests about us. OK, keep it. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay. Dating a Catholic is like dating a tribe. And dating a tribe is like dating a nation. And dating a nation is like dating a football star. And dating a football star is like dating a new car. And dating a new car is like dating an air freshener. And dating an air freshener is like dating silver tinsel. And dating, I'm sorry, and dating an air freshener is like dating a fake tree. And dating a fake tree is like dating silver tinsel. 
And dating silver tinsel is like dating a holiday. And dating a holiday is like dating a black man. And dating a black man is like dating a top. And dating a top is like dating a bottom. And dating a bottom is like dating an Asian. And dating an Asian is like dating a dragon. And dating a dragon is like dating a fireplace. And dating a fireplace is like dating a mantle. And dating a mantle is like dating a picture frame. And dating a picture frame is like dating Martin Luther King with Jesus. And dating Martin Luther King and Jesus is like dating a threesome. And dating a threesome is like dating a commune. And dating a commune is like dating an unachievable idea. And dating an idea is like dating the enlightenment. And dating the enlightenment is like dating science. And dating science is like dating a beaker. And dating a beaker is like dating a pharmacy. And dating a pharmacy is like dating a dealer. And dating a dealer is like dating a supply chain. And dating a supply chain is like dating a Republican. And dating a Republican is like dating winter. And dating winter is like dating Demeter. And dating Demeter is like dating corn. And dating corn is like dating pancakes. And dating pancakes is like dating and dating is like dating utopia. And dating utopia is like dating an Amish woman. And dating an Amish woman is like dating a Luddite. And dating a Luddite is like dating a folk hero. And dating a folk hero is like dating Robert Zimmerman. And dating Robert Zimmerman is like dating a white man. And dating a white man is like dating insecurity. And dating insecurity is like dating a Hummer. And dating a Hummer is like dating the Pentagon. And dating the Pentagon is like dating a lost star. And dating a lost star is like dating a liberal. And dating a liberal is like dating a Jew. And dating a Jew is like dating a lamp. And dating a lamp is like dating a blonde. And dating a blonde is like dating Ikea. And dating Ikea is like dating Whole Foods. And dating Whole Foods is like dating a Daycon. And dating a Daycon is like dating an e-reader. And dating an e-reader is like dating a TV. And dating a TV is like dating a commercial. And dating a commercial is like dating a serial murderer. And dating a serial murderer is like dating Raskolnikov. And dating Raskolnikov is like dating a rationalist. And dating a rationalist is like dating an academic. And dating an academic is like dating a CV. And dating a CV is like dating a white woman. And dating a white woman is like dating a bread line. And dating a bread line is like dating a pat of butter. And dating a pat of butter is like dating a femme fatale. And dating a femme fatale is like dating Paris Hilton. And dating Paris Hilton is like dating a tabloid. And dating a tabloid is like dating a communist. And dating a communist is like dating cut flowers. And dating cut flowers is like dating infidelity. And dating infidelity is like dating a pool. So, work in progress. I envision a long book <laughs> with 
a bunch of those, which should be a lot of fun. Um, if you notice, I paused during some of them, and that was mainly because there were some things that I see were being filmed, and I just didn't want it to go out to public access or wherever. It would have been kind of difficult to explain that. Okay. Um, this is also a new poem, Special Needs. Only the skin runs ahead like a spruced up dream from which I never awake. What really exists, no one knows. In exchange for shook foil, Hopkins killed the agnostic in him. I want to kill the polygamist in me. I am most me in an alley off Broadway where I pretend to be homeless and a friend to stray cats like St. Francis. My young cousins only want hard words and money. If the economy sinks, they will kill you quicker than a brainwave. I want to give my sympathy to the last evangelical. Here I am twirling my fork, aching to pierce some roasted strip of thought. As long as the maid is blaring, as long as the mind is blaring, we avoid the straight jackets of conformity. I am tired of the taste of my life. I will not sleep for days for my egg had a seizure in the frying pan. This morning, I rubbed my hands together back and forth, summoning the angels away from the orthodoxy of facades. I reach for the pepper shaker on my spice rack and recall all the pimps of Chelsea and all the Johns on Wall Street. I see joggers in the street, and they remind me of my most treasured liaisons. It's also inscription. Five gold wash pearls on a wrist. Her seraph skin glistening as she clenches his back. Layers of clothes topped by her cinema straw derby hat. A thin wisp of sheen above his brow. An evening dinner of lightning and clouds, the sky's release of electrical surplus, followed by prosciutto with wilted greens tossed in arbuquina olive oil and lemon, until all at once they voicelessly consumed the echoes of all their past. Possible objects of high regard, stalactites dripping in a cave, delicately carved tortoiseshell combs. He treasured the cambers of her body. Okay. This is um, a, from uh, a recent poems from Holding Company. Um, if you buy this book, you'll, you you uh, we'll notice that all the poems are ten lines, ten line poems. And believe it or not, I used to, you can't hear it now, but maybe, um, I used to write long narrative poems. And to write ten line poems was really an exercise in uh, compression to see how much I can uh, get language to either sing or insinuate um, in those kind of short lines. This is called Fever. If I can find it. <coughs> Fever. Had I possessed the poise to kick aside my faraway thirst for mornings, or the wide solo and the listening glass emptied of speech, had I possessed the incorruptible sermons of window panes, or danced a little more in the lush inscriptions of your gaze. I who believe in the fauna of dreams and the hand that tunes a guitar in the will of pages might have journeyed to you like ash and abandoned all my fires and named the epic lights over your shoulders and seized your tumble down rapture. Manna. As if every evening your body is a smile mingling with the sea, 
or the sky's last song over the cenotaph of violets wilting in Eastham. On the day of the crime, the afternoon was empty. We were footnotes on the beach and came back the color of pancakes. I was giving the Rosicrucians another chance, knowing how hunger prevails long after we've turned our backs on cruelty towards Faulkner and Seneca. My gratitude was fragile. I was kissing the thorns. To see, to see, shouted the marvelous girls, to see. Picket Monsters. For I was born too in the stunted winter of history. For I too desired the lion's mouth split. And the world that is not ours. And the wounded children set free to their turnstiles of wonder. I too have blinked speechless at the valleys of corpses. Wished Griabin's black mass in the executioner's ear. Ellington in the interrogation room. I now seek gardens where bodies have their will, where the self is a compass point given to the lost. Let me call your name. The ground here is soft and broken. Okay. This is um, a section of a long poem, uh, a letter poem or, a, or epistolary poem to the poet Gwendolyn Brooks, who I had the great pleasure of meeting. And around the time that I met her, she had passed away. And then um, uh, shortly after, and then um, around that time also I was reading a poem by the poet W.H. Auden, who had written this long, gorgeous, lush letter to the romantic poet Lord Byron. And I thought, what a clever idea to write to a dead poet. And when she... And, when she passed away, I knew that the letter would go to her. Um, this poem um, is written in, an, in a host of sections. Um, I'm going to mix up, uh, just in case those of you who have the book, um, I'm going to mix the sections up a little bit. Um, it was meant to be a, a longer poem um, whose sections are named after subway stops in Philadelphia that I grew up, where I grew up along the uh, Broad Street line, beginning with the northernmost point and making its way all the way down to um, the last stop on the Broad Street line, um, Patterson. And uh, uh, I got tired of writing them, so I got off the train somewhere near around uh, City Hall. Um, and like long poems um, where the speaker kind of invokes the help of some god or deity, uh, which is why Dante um, grabs Virgil and asks him to guide him through. Um, I invoke Orpheus and my other god, Kanye West. <laughs> and as I was writing, his friends were asking, um, why are you writing in rhyme? And so it was meant to be a travelogue as well as a, um, a space where I can work out conversations. So a lot, they didn't realize when they were asking this, they were giving me material. So this is where I, I kind of answer them. O oh, Orpheus, grant the gift to stir the dead. Like Kanye mixing music with fire, spitting souls through wires. Let me show for the true and living through muck and mire. Rescue the underground so they aim higher. Grant the gift to chisel words like the beers. W let them dangle. Let words dangle. Verbal gems for their ears. I put a premium on rhymes. How could I not? Living the times of the super MCs, where styles are deaf and lyrics fly tight the way our minds move over beats and grooves. Our brain matters amped. Mic check. So we nonstop. My spirit feels echoes thanks to hip hop. I thought to send this note to Tupac, then wonder if he's there with you. Rumor has it he's far from dead, that in fact he lives like Asada in Cuba, having fled death row. His mask consumes us 
Still, a rapper shot, a martyr is born, sad not the man but the image we mourn. A cafeteria was all one needed, a beatbox firm as the heart, we begin a flow, spitting rhymes that superseded our teacher's verdict, dim-witted children who never taste Marchand de Vin. So rap's dawning was the earth's reality to give a sound to a collective necessity couched in that we of the real always keeping it. Those hallway leanings, that attitude, no grace, that much future you heard, that sugar on the hill, ganging up airways, those public enemy freedom phrases, those boogie downs and big daddy canes, those diggable planets and Afro names, that Rakim or Mr. Eric or, or Mr. Eric B or disposable heroes of hypocrisy, that salt and pepper, Roxanne, Roxanne and West Coast Coolio and Fista X clans, those questing tribes spitting concertos of the desperados, but the boom baps done gone jiggy, and every other word is ho or niggy, nicka, still all the same, one frame of the nation spells hunger, and like a straw to the brain, video poison normalizes that game, so our children learn to point guns, and thus we need life like the Fuji's needed Lauren. I had a, I haven't read this poem in a while. Um, where I grew up in Philadelphia, there was a guy who walked around like he was driving a car. And this was a source of, 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 fun for me and my friends whenever we would see see him inevitably we would gently tease him but not fully um, by asking him what kind of car he was driving or making a mistake saying how much we liked his Jaguar of which he would stop and look at us like we were crazy and he would correct us and say this is a his Mercedes or his BMW today because <laughs> he had many cars um, and the girls had fun by asking him for a ride to which he would gently park the car and like a gentleman walk out and around the car and open the door. But no girl got in, <laughs> which would have been a lot of fun to see two people walking side by side and one of them driving. Um, this is This is some kind of crazy. It doesn't matter if you can't see Steve's Corvette, turquoise colored, plush purple seats, gold trim rims that make little stars in your eyes as if the sun is kneeling, kissing the edge of sanity. Like a Baptist preacher stroking the dark underside of God's wet tongue, he can make you believe it's there. His scuff wingtips, ragged, shuffling concrete could be 10 inch firestone wheels. His vocal cords fake an eight-cylinder engine that wags like a dog's tail as he shifts gears. Imagine Steve, moonstruck, cool, turning right onto Ridge Avenue, arms forming arcs, his hands a set of stiff seas overthrowing each other's rule, his lithe body and head snapping back, pushing a stick shift into fourth, whizzing past Uncle Sam's pawn shop past the stop and go. Only he knows his destination, his limits. Can you see him? Imagine Steve, moonstruck, cool, parallel parking between a pacer and a pinto. Obviously the most hip, backing up, head over right shoulder, one hand spinning as if polishing a dream. And there's Tina wanting to know what makes a boy tick, wanting a one-way trip to the stars? We the faithful never call him crazy, crack-brained, just a little touched. It's all he ever wants, a car, a girl, a community of believers. So this book is pretty much um, a portrait of people that I grew up with. Um, I wrote this book in graduate school 
um, on the West Coast in Oregon. And so writing about them was a way of, of bringing them back and rendering them per, uh, permanent on the page. Um, this is called uh, Blunt. The first time I got high, I stood in a circle of boys at 23rd and Ridge, tucked inside a doorway that smelled of urine. It was March. The cold rains all but blurred our sight as we feigned sophistication, passing a bullet-shaped bottle of malt. Johnny Cash had a love for transcendental numbers and explained between puffs resembling little gas of air the link to all creation was the mathematician. Malik, the smartest of the crew, counter-argued and cited the holy life of prayer as a gateway to the Islamic faith that was for all intents the true path for the righteous black man. No one disputed. Malik cocked his head, pinched the joint, and pulled so hard we imagined his lips crazy glued into stiff O's. It was long agreed that Lefty would inherit his father's used car business, thus destined for a life of wrecks. Then, amid a fit of coughing, I broke the silence. I want to be a poet. It was nearing dinner time. Jesus lived here. His sister was yelling at their siblings over the evening news and game shows. The stench of hot dogs and sauerkraut drifted down the dank hallway. A pre-spring wind flapped the plastic covering of a junk man's shopping cart. As Eddie Hardrick licked left to right the thin strip of glue at the edge of a rolling paper, then uttered, So, you want the tongue of God? I bent double in the blade of smoke and looked up for help. It was too late. We were tragically hip. <laughs> this is a, a poem called Mr. Pate's Barber Shop. Uh, Mr. Pape was a neighborhood barber who cut my hair and the hair of a number of kids in the neighborhood. And um, we had a wonderful rumor that we passed around, which is that... Um, he never threw hair away, that he swept it up and put it in jars and kept it in the back of his shop. Um, and you'll hear why. Mr. Pate's Barbershop. I remember the room in which he held a blade to my neck and scraped the dark hairs forresting a jawline. Stacks of ebonies and jets, clippings of black boxers, Joe Fraser, Jimmy Young, Jack Johnson. The color television bolted to a ceiling like the one I watched all night in the waiting room at St. Joseph's while my cousin recovered from gunshots. I remember the old Coke machine, a water fountain by the door, how I drank the summer of 88 over and over from a paper cone cup and still cannot quench my thirst. For this was the year funeral homes boomed. The year Mr. Pate swept his own shop, for he had lost his best little helper to crossfire. He suffered, like most barbers suffered, quietly, his clippers humming so loud he forgot Ali's lightning left jab, his love for angles, for carpentry, for baseball. He forgot everything and would never be the same. I remember the way the blade gleamed fierce in the fading light of dusk and a reflection panned inside the razor's edge, wondering if I could lay down my pen, close up my ledgers, my journals, if I could undo my tie and take up barbering, where months on end a child's head would darken at my feet and bring with it the uncertainty of tomorrow, or like Mr. Pate gathering clumps of fallen hair at the end of a day in short delicate wisps as though they were the fine findings of gold dust He'd deposit in a jar and place on a shelf only to return Saturdays, collecting as an antique dealer collects, growing tired but never forgetting someone has to cherish these tiny little heads. Okay, I'll read a few from here. Yeah. Um... My uh, teacher, substitute teacher in fourth grade, um, had a very difficult time 
uh, saying roll for the first time. And so the next day, instead of repeating her performance, that took about half an hour, just call roll. Um, she decided to give us new names. And they were the names of French painters. Um, and even then, that struck me in fourth grade as not right. <laughs> um, this is called Urban Renewal. What of my fourth grade teacher at Reynolds Elementary, who weary after failed attempts to set to memory names strange and meaningless as grains of dirt around the mouthless mountain caves at Bahrain, Karai, Tariq, Shaniqua, Amari, Aisha, nicknamed the entire class after French painters, whether boy or girl. Behold the beginning of sentient, formless life. And so my best friend Darnell became Marcel, and T.T. was Brock, and Stacy James was Fragonard, and I, Eduard Charlemont. The time has come to look at these signs from other points of view. Days passed in activity before I corrected her, for Eduard was Austrian and painted the black chief in the palace in 1878 to the question whether intelligence exists. All of Europe swooned to Venus of Willendorf, outside her tongue, yet of it. In textbooks, Herodotus tells us of the legend of Siswasret, Egyptian, colonizer of Greece, founder of Athens. So what's in a name? Sagas rise and fall in the orbs of jump ropes. Hannibal grasps a Roman monkey bar on history's rung. And the mighty heroes at recess lay dead and woe on the imagined battlefields of Halo. Okay, when I want to read a few more. Maddeningly elusive, yet endlessly tempting. Like a far off scream, like a mannequin leaning back seat into other mannequins careening, it could stand for something, just about, but gauzy and gray, great slabs ease over, and root like stems wither. The radio plays, reducing us to a point. Laugh and laugh, it says even as a box of, box of Kleenex scrapes your hand. The neighborhood sparks and becomes that blue haze, screams inside of screens, which will not stop the coming of frost, only more frames. If I said all ants are fascists, would that be the comic turn? When the eyes fill up, a kind of composting, an occasion dresses for the mountainside, Mardi Gras in the hills, downpour of skeins, each brilliant spiraling suicide, a paper float like this one here. But then a father sets his pieces on a chessboard, the way a painter spreads out vows of colors on a windowsill. And even this reminds me of emptying brown bags of groceries, always first cauliflower, the little white trees felled in the bins, then miniature vats of yogurt, then slender bodies of asparagus dry heaving beneath blankets of plastic. A woman sets her keys on the counter through involuntary sniggers. Something releases, like a red balloon one forgets one never owned. And in her right eye she feels emancipation, and in her left the swell of peppermint pulls her towards the center of a far-off cry. Then something else lets go. The ancient wetness of clouds washing the sidewalks of memory. Here and there, smoke rises from asphalt, like tranquil fire smoldering, or fog lifting, like so many dead at once, that eternal chorus hurts. Okay, just three more here. Mm. Mm. 
I apologize. I think I announced I left a sheaf of poems somewhere in the world. It might be a good thing, actually, if we all did that. Just <laughs> leave them out there. Who knows? Who knows what change? Um, yeah. I used to be an accountant, believe it or not. Um, I went to business school. And sometimes I miss it, believe it or not, the numbers, the columns, everything balancing out. Um, I reconcile my bank account once a year when tax time comes around. What a great journey that is. <laughs> Full frontal management. A time not quite long ago when cubicles had a forthrightness to them and resembled an open-air village like a pre-union factory floor, less grimy and modular. I dreamed of joining the ranks, young and inexperienced in the ways of extended sage burning and other epitaphs. I knew not how to reach up and pull gravity to my head. Others displayed family photos and cartoon clippings, pin-cushioned around them like special reminders that they were indeed alive elsewhere, if not here. I kept it classified, inured to the shock of balance sheets, like paper mirrors of my ambition. You are the dupe of Soissons, is what the plants had to say. I went around whispering, kiss my upper face, in a few years you won't regret it and other soul-satisfying pratfalls. In the office kitchen, we grunted endlessly, like spoiled debutantes in front of rows of fluted glassware. But of course, such practice emaciation was fadistic and meretricious. Go ask your glass eye. Okay. And two more. Um, these were... These are poems that end uh, leaving Saturn. How to listen. I'm going to cock my head tonight like a dog in front of McGlinchey's tavern on Locust. I'm going to stand beside the man who works all day, combing his thatch of gray hair, corkscrewed in every direction. I'm going to pay attention to our lives unraveling between the forks of his fine tooth comb. For once, we won't talk about the end of the world, or Vietnam, or his exquisite paper shoes. For once, I am going to ignore the profanity, and the dancing, and the jukebox, so I can hear his head crackle beneath the sky's stretch of faint stars. Indian Song. Freddie, oh, I should say this. <laughs> um, so inside this poem for the kids, um, I referenced something called a cassette deck. <laughs> and this was in cars. Um, and they were made of plastic, these tapes, and you stuck them in, and music came out. <laughs> Not like your iPads, which you can just plug in, and your iPhones. and. <clears throat> Indian song. Freddie Hubbard's planned the cassette deck, 40 miles outside Hayes, and I looked at this Kansas sunset for three hours now, bristling as big rigs bounce and grumble along I-70. At this speed, cornfields come in splotches, murky yellows and greens abutting the road shoulder, the flat wealth of the nation whirring by. It's a kind of ornamentation I've gotten used to, as in a dream, espaliered against the skies blazing, Clout Luff's cascade lace-like, darkening whole fields. 30,000 feet above, someone is buttering a muffin. Someone stares at a sky phone, and momentarily a baby cries in pressurized air. Through double-paned squares, someone squints, fields cross-hatched by asphalt strips. It is said, Cezanne looked at a landscape so long he felt as if his eyes were bleeding. 
No matter that, I'm heading west. It's all so redolent. This wailing music. By my side, you fingering fields of light. Sunflowers over earth. Miles traveled. A patchwork of goodbyes. Thank you. Hi, Jude. Well, just to kind of follow up on that, then, what, what, how does story fit in? And you mentioned moving away from story, but towards compression. Yeah. Well, the um, the stories that I wrote, the narratives that I wrote about were triggered, were by necessity. Like some of those poems written in graduate school um, were were pretty much elegies of people who had lost due to um, circumstances that were quite tragic. And so uh, the narratives uh, had an urgency to them. And I always like narratives that have some sort of lyric departure, that move away from that time that's created in the poem. And we, and we also feel this maybe more so in fiction when there's a flashback or when there's a long meditation on an object or the meaning of of uh, some action. Um, that sense of timelessness is important to me and that's what I'm trying to ultimately achieve. Right now I'm, I'm moving away from the narrative frame and just hoping to write poems that have that feel of timelessness to them. Yes. I don't know really how to ask this question, but uh, the, the poem with, with your old buddy, um, when you said I wanted to be a poet, and I, I don't know what age that was, but how did they respond to that? And, you know, and, and kind of what's your what's your story, um, just, you know, real, real briefly of how you, you know, cause you, obviously you have the, you know, some hip hop influences, but then right. you, know, you have the, the more, I don't know, classical or postmodern influences as well. Like, right. Just, you know, how, yep. how, did, how did they react when you said that? Or, yeah. Uh, where are they, where are they at? Well, what's interesting is that not all the narratives are, are, uh, true. <laughs> um, I always say, you know, why should fiction writers get all the fun? Poets need to lie more in their poems. Um, yeah. Um, so, but if I know them, well, this is kind of related actually. Uh, Growing up, my you know I was like golden age of hip hop. Um, we all wanted to to be rappers, and so you had your book of rhymes, and we called ourselves poets, you know, um, uh, for that reason. And it wouldn't it did, it wasn't like that invoke the image of Robert Frost. What it invoke was <laughs> Chuck D. You know, what I mean, <laughs> to call yourself a poet. Um, but of course, I was reading as a kid. My grandparents had uh, uh, not, a, I want to say a library, but that makes it sound like a grand room with like Edwardian walls, wooden walls, and uh, ladders. Um, no, they, they had books in the house, and there was poetry, two volumes of poetry, Robert Frost, and selected poems of uh, Langston Hughes. Um, and that's. That sparked it, I would say. Those were kind of my quiet treasures. And then um, hip-hop came along, and like I said, I wanted to do that. And uh, I did go to a pretty, very good high school. So the the foundation of the kind of both American and English literature was there all along. But, you know, you go... For my parents, you know, for me to say I was going to college to become an English major, um, just wouldn't have gotten the support I needed from them. So accounting, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, and then uh, I did work as an accountant at a nonprofit, a uh, few nonprofits, uh, art center in Philadelphia, a construction company in Boston, and then. Um, applied for this major award and started living this dual life of writing poetry and then working, saving up my money, 
and then living off my savings and writing, doing the bohemian artist thing, and then putting on a tie again after I, the money ran out. And, and uh, until uh, I went to graduate school and started teaching um, first uh, in New Orleans at Xavier University, and then uh, uh, since 2002 at University of Vermont, and then a few other places here and there. But um, when I got the job in Vermont is when I said, I said no to my life or said goodbye to my life as an accountant. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> I think about it. Hi, yes. Oh, I was just, um, there's a great um, book that Yale University Press pulled up called the Yale Anthology of, uh, the Yale Anthology of Rap. And it's all, the, it's like lyrics broken down over five distinct periods, edited by um, Adam Bradley, wonderful uh, scholar, um, and Andrew Du Bois, also another wonderful scholar. Um, so I was just recently flipping through that because I was teaching a course called Hip Hop and Poetry and dusting off the, uh, my syllabus. I still, um, am drawn to that period. Um, and most of the rappers that come from like the 80s and 90s. Um, but my love affair was with the native tongue posse, Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, um, and everyone around them. Um, but, um, I know he's a, you know, very, he might, I think he has a house out here. <laughs> I think Jay Z is an amazing rapper. Um, but, uh, geez, Kendrick Lamar is amazing. Immortal Technique is fantastic. Before he got all political, um, uh, you would never know if you never, who's that? Come on, the younger ones in the room. His name will come to me in a second. Lupe, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and my my son is, you know, when we were being in a car, we would play this game, Hip Hop 101, and I would just like, <laughs> just do a sample, you know. And when I was in high school, I had to do that with classical music, so I just kind of flipped the script and uh, would do that. And so... He now wants to be a DJ. I mean, he is a, he is a DJ, but he wants, he wants to be a producer and, um, he can hear the samples inside the samples, both the, the soul and the, and the classic rock and everything. You know, we've mined it all. And so I love his ear. He has about, about three or four generations of music inside of him. Um, my grandfather was a big, uh, blues and jazz and, I have those old albums of his. So Langston is, um, I wish him, I hope it happens for him, but he turns me on to a lot of music. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Someone else? Yes. How's yes. your, uh, have you noticed any change in your work or your style from the, you know, half and half bohemian accounting days to more academic? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there is, there, there are huge differences. I'm, I've been hugely influenced over the past five years by the post-World War II experimental poets, um, American poets, um, the New York School poets. Uh, they're not categorized yet, but like I mentioned earlier, uh, the Fluxus poets and, um, that spirit of experimentation was something that I didn't have when I was younger. Um, it was all about Eliot's tradition, you know, being in the tradition and of modernism and uh, subsequent schools of modernism um, in the reply to modernism. So my early influences were Gwendolyn Brooks and Robert Lowell um, and Derek Walcott. And now I'm allowing myself to... Um, read and explore other poets. I was hoping it came through, but I didn't read enough poems um, from Holding Company. But um, there's there's Kavafi, there's a lot of global poets also um, 
who are kind of behind those poems, at least their their tone, their voice, a lot of Central European poets as well. For me, each book is, and actually each poem, I don't go into a poem knowing, feeling like I know either A, what I'm going to write or what shape it's going to take. Uh, each poem is an act of experimenting and discovering something new. I try to let the, let the poem teach me about poetry and what language can do rather than feeling like I'm, I'm the captain on the ship or the director. Um, and that's about listening, listening to the poem. Thank you very much for being here. I'm very appreciative.